Hey team, welcome back to another episode of the Strength Game Podcast. I'm your host, Nick O'Brien, and this is episode 105. The Strength Game is a weekly podcast dedicated to discussing all things physical culture with the coaches, athletes, iron enthusiasts, and experts deeply embedded in the strength game on both sides of the profession, both as coaches and as competitive athletes. I want to thank everyone who has liked, shared, commented, your support allows us to continue to bring on expert guests and highlight more individuals in the strength game, just like our guests today. I also want to thank our sponsors, family owned and operated since 1976. Samson Equipment has been specializing in full turnkey weight room buildouts from planning to installation. Based in Las Cruz, New Mexico, Samson provides professional weight room solutions for those looking to lead the way in advancing our strength conditioning profession. Coaches have relied on Samson as their top resource for all their weight room renovations because they provide the finest materials and design, product customization, and the most reputable customer service in the business. If you're in the market for elite level strength equipment, weight room renovations, or upgrades, be sure to check out samsonequipment.com to see how Samson has been providing clients a long-lasting yet affordable product for over four decades. I also want to thank our so sponsor, Cerberus Strength. Trusted since 2012, Cerberus is making the best strongman, powerlifting, and strength sports equipment and accessories, ensuring the ultimate competitive edge. Every one of their products is tried, tested, and proven by top-level athletes worldwide. So if you're in the market for the highest quality strength and conditioning gear and equipment, be sure to check out serverstrength.com and use our promo code strength underscore game to save on your next order. And in this episode, I am joined by Nick Sedato. Nick is an assistant strength conditioning coach at Boston College. Sedato arrived at BC in 2018, where he began working as an intern before being promoted to a graduate assistant coach in 2019 and then full-time assistant coach in 2020. Over his tenure at BC, he's assisted with all 31 Olympic sports teams and now leads the performance training for the Eagles women's lacrosse, field hockey, and men's and women's golf teams. In his current role, he has reached the NCAA National Championship in three consecutive years with the lacrosse program, who won the title in 2021 and most recently won the ACC Championships in 2023. Sedato started his career in the private sector, first as an intern coach at Evolution Sports Performance in Easton, Massachusetts in 2017. He was an assistant strength coach at MJP Strength Conditioning in Boston, as well as sports performance coach at Velocity Sports Performance in Norwood, Mass. from 2018 to 2019. He also gained experience as an intern at Harvard University in the fall of 2019. Sedato is also the author of sweat more during peace, bled, bleed less during war, preparation tactics that generate success. A former football player at Bridgewater State University, Sedato continues to stay active in his spare time, training throughout the demanding collegiate athletics year-round season. I'm excited to have him on the show today. So with all that said, let's get into the game with Coach Nick Sedato. What's going on, everybody? Today, I have Coach Nick Sedato and future or soon-to-be author. What's going on today, Coach? Hey, Nick. How's it going? Hey, man. I'm, I'm excited to get you on. I know uh, when this releases, the book will be officially launched. Um, I know we'll, we'll definitely touch on that stuff as we get going. Um, congrats on that, by the way. I know that's a huge accomplishment. Um, but before we kind of dive into the book and we kind of dive into everything you're doing as a coach, like I really want to touch on how you got yourself involved in the strength game, like your introduction to training sports, because I know you played football as well in college. Like what was that inception like and what are you currently doing now to train? Yeah, so my first exposure to, you know, strength and conditioning and just training in general was, you know, dating back to probably seventh or eighth grade. Um 
you know, the local football, you know, high school football team, they brought somebody in to kind of teach the basics of movement. And to be honest, I absolutely hated it. I was in the eighth grade. I was athletic, but I was the skinny build. I was taller. Um, and I hated it. I was like, oh, I hate the weight room, all this stuff. But as I got to playing more, once I got into ninth grade and freshman year of high school, um, you know, I started playing up. So I got the call up to varsity and a couple of sports. And I, I really, and I talked to my dad about this and some players and, and my siblings too. And like, hey, your next step is you got to get stronger. You know, you can you can play with these these athletes, you know, athletically, but um, where you're going to start to lose is, is in the strength and they jump higher than you and they can move you in the paint and on the field, you're going to get tackled and all this stuff. So um, I hatched on to my dad a little bit. Um, he, he would wake up in the morning for work and he'd go and, and work with a trainer. And so um, he brought me along one day and, and I started working out with him before school. And um, it was a good exposure for me because, like I said, I didn't initially like the weight room. Um, and it was mostly bodybuilding stuff. But um, I immediately start to see the gains, like within a couple months, you know, that that training age is so low, you see the gains pretty quickly. Um, and I started to feel more confident. And I could see it out on, on the court and out on the field. Um, and so I just kept rolling with it. And so probably freshman and sophomore year of high school, I would just wake up in the morning three days a week and just go with my dad to his trainer and just just do some training. Um, and it was very basic stuff. Like I said, bodybuilding stuff it wasn't athletically geared, um, but it was kind of my first exposure to it. Um, and then once I got to junior and senior year, I started putting some muscle mass. That's when I started training with the football team at the school and all that stuff. Um, we didn't have a strength coach. It was just the high school football coach, you know, running the program. Um, looking back, it's pretty funny the stuff that we were doing, but um, there's some good memories there. Um, just the camaraderie aspect with the guys and training. Um, and then it was time to play uh, college. So I, I went on to play college football at Bridgewater State, just division three football. And um, that summer I ended up working with uh, I went to an athletic performance center. Um, it was actually a family friend who owned it. So we got a little bit of discount for me to go there. Um, and I loved it. It was very athletic based. I was sprinting, jumping, you know, doing all the, the stuff that we, we implement now as coaches. And that was my first exposure to how athletes actually train. Um, and from there, I, I kind of fell in love with the process. I went on to play college football. We didn't have a strength coach at the D3 level, unfortunately, either. Uh, but I was able to learn a lot in my experience that I had. I kind of knew what to do to train. And, you know, I'm no different than any other strength coach. You know, we all start off as athletes and we're competitive. And that's kind of how we fell in love with it. But for me, you know, what really stood out is when I got to college, I fell in love with the process of preparing for the sport almost as much as playing the sport itself. So, yeah, I love to play football. But I love the offseason just as much, waking up early in the morning, training hard with the guys, going through those grueling conditioning sessions together. Um, I love that process. So um, <clears throat> I studied exercise science at, at the school and then, you know, it just took off from there. And, um, you know, I finished up my my college playing career. And that's when I got into all my internships and my graduate assistantship and kind of really got into the field. No, that's awesome. Yeah, I think I think you're exactly right. A lot of strength coaches end up may whether they're really good or not like at their sport whatever their choice is to be they they really more so probably start falling more in love as or appreciating it more as they go through their high school or college career towards the end in that off season portion and like seeing what you can do to prepare yourself you might not have all the skill or talent to kind of really showcase it on the field uh, but that work ethic and like the character traits that you're getting from going in on a consistent basis and and working working it through, like that's that's what really kind of drives people's passion. So that's cool to see. When you first went to Bridgewater, was that were you kind of even teetering towards like strength conditioning, like exercise science, or like did that become like a different decision? Because I know like now education has been kind of big for you. Like you have two, you have two masters on top of it. So obviously like you found like a path and you found like some excitement in the education side, but that, is that initially like what your thought process was going into playing? Yeah. So actually when I was um, training at that private performance center, getting ready for college, I remember specifically asking the trainer, I was like, this is what you do for a living. Like you get paid to just train athletes all day. Um, and a very naive question is like, yeah, like, this is what I do. This is what I love to do. And so from that day on, I was like, wow, like, this is what I want to do too. 
So part of my decision process to go into college and playing football was making sure that they had what I want to study. So they had the exercise science program there. So, you know, right from the get-go, I was studying exercise science and I knew I wanted to go down that route. Now I will say freshman, sophomore year of college, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. I didn't know if I want to work at a private performance center. Um, Cause you know, when you're young, you start looking at the money aspect and I'm like, all right, well, I need to make some money here. And, you know, so you start looking at different routes. I know I don't want to work a desk job. I want to be involved athletically through sports, whatever it may be. Um, so I started really looking at the PT route um, and I was starting to look at PT schools, but that was another two years after my four year undergrad. Um, and so I kind of followed that route, or at least I thought that's where I wanted to go until about senior year until, um, you know, I reached out, did my first internship um, actually at the place I was training at Evolution Sports Performance, got my first internship there um, at that senior year. And then from there, um, I was like, all right, I'm not going to go the PT route because I started talking to some networks and people and, you know, it wasn't guaranteed that I get to work with athletes. Um, yeah, you're going to train, you know, general pop clients and rehabilitation and all that stuff. But, you know, athletically wasn't guaranteed. And I, I knew I wanted to work with athletes. So that's when I kind of, you know, went to my next internship um, and kind of went from there. But yeah, education was definitely a huge part of it. And um, like I actually know a lot of other strength coaches that kind of had this thought process too of first being like the PT route because you just look at the money aspect or um, you think it's going to be something that it's actually not. Um, but I just fell in love with the athletic side of it. I just I knew I had to go down that road. Yeah, I I think I, I teetered with that route too after after being in the profession for a little bit and like it was the the money aspect does hurt at some places and if you don't have like a support system or if you don't have you're not in the location or your contract's not very good or there i mean there's a multitude of reasons that can kind of affect that too or affect your life outside of it which really makes a difference like that can either factor into being paid low or factor into being paid high like what well, it's kind of whatever your goals are so i like i teeter to that too and then realize that it's going to be three, four years. Cause I was missing one class to even like apply to PT school. So I had to take the class and then apply the next year because they yeah. didn't offer that class during the summer. And I was like, no, but yeah, you, that's, that's the hard part too. Cause I think now it's a little bit more public knowledge. Like we're starting to see it now where you see what college coaches make or some of the big ones make. And then a lot more places are starting to publicize what those assistant positions make too. So I think it's, it de definitely deters a few people to like, even like get into the profession or it might push people out a lot sooner realizing that hey, assistant coaches, like depending on the demographic and like your location across the board or like somewhere between like 30 and 45, 50, like how long can you do that for? Are you okay with doing that? It's it's kind of a hard aspect when you realize that like you can put in more work and not get necessarily a financial payout. But if you do more work at a private facility, like you get more clients, which equals more money, or you can branch out to a different place. And it's a lot easier to kind of move and not have to change your location and stuff too. It's I know exactly what you mean, not, even not working in the private sector very much. But like that financial aspect is, is super important for coaches. And I think that's why you're starting to see more people have kind of like side things going on, too. Yeah, absolutely. And especially like when you're graduating with, with all that debt from your undergrad, too, like you got to get paid pretty soon. So even just going the collegiate route when you, you have to unfortunately take internship after internship, sometimes, you know, three, four, whatever it may be, even longer sometimes, um, you know, that starts to weigh on you. And, and looking back, though I was an athlete and I played throughout college, I didn't have a lot of extra time on my hands. You know, looking back, if I were to do it again, I definitely would have done internships earlier. Um, I think that would have helped me out in my maturation as a coach earlier on. Yeah, I know that that definitely benefited me, too. But I, I kind of I realized that I wanted to be a coach like and I knew I wanted to be in college right away as soon as I started getting into that atmosphere. So I started branching out as much as possible because I was already playing at the school. And then like I knew everybody there and I kind of like fell from a volunteer role up to a GA position. So I was already leading teams before I was even a GA. So 
I knew that I couldn't just have one place on my resume. I knew I I needed to kind of see what other places were doing. And I'm, I'm sure you probably felt the same way too, that if you want to be a high level coach, there is a little bit of pressure to get to kind of the pinnacle, like division one. And when you're at a division three level, like you didn't even have a strength coach. So it's hard to even rely on someone and talk to a person that's not even there. And I had a strength coach, but we only had one full-time and three GAs. So really you're learning from the GAs and they're only a year or two ahead of you. You're they're kind of in the similar boat as you. So branching out and finding like your kind of path and where you want to fall into a collegiate position or a private sector position, like is important to kind of garner some experience and free volunteering is the way to kind of do it. Yeah, absolutely. And and what helped me too is especially with the getting into the collegiate side of things is coming from the private. My, the first job I took after my undergrad was in the private setting. And, you know, I think all things happen for a reason. And that's where I met my mentor. He hired me MJP strength and conditioning. His name's Mike Poitamani. He was uh, the head football strength coach at Boston college for six years. And then before that he was at Western Michigan for some years. And um, he was a collegiate guy. He just settled down for his family's sake and all that. And he started his own private business, but at heart, he was a collegiate guy. And he kind of molded me he, and he, he honestly pushed me to go try out the collegiate setting. And I was coaching for him all that summer. He pushed me to get my certifications and he saw a lot of potential in me that I didn't even know I had. Um, and he's like, Hey, you're, you, you know, you're doing a great job. You're a great coach. I want you to go try out the collegiate setting. I still have connections at Boston college. Um, I'll put in a call for you, go do an internship. You know, if you like it, pursue it. If you don't come back and work for me, no big deal, but it's going to make you a better coach. And, and you got to see, you got to see if that's what you want to do. And I'm happy he pushed me and, and he's my mentorship. He's taught me everything. Um, but if it wasn't for him, I don't know where I'd be right now. I'd probably be in the private setting. But all I know is that when I stepped foot in the collegiate setting as a coach, as an intern, I knew right away, this is exactly what I want to do. So it was very fortunate that I kind of got that push early on. No, it's awesome to have a mentor that, especially in the private setting, has some collegiate experience and, and is is not biased to the fact that, well, they're working in the private sector now. And like he instead of like telling you the pros and cons of each, he just said, hey, I'll connect you with someone. Go experience it yourself. And I think kind of getting under the bar and and going, get your hands dirty and doing it on your own versus kind of hearing people's other anecdotes and like experiences they had, like that's, that's super important. And I think, I think you're right too. Like there's so much you can take away from a private setting that helps you in the college and the same like college setting that helps you private sector. What, uh, what, what do you think like is something you learn from maybe MJP or evolution or any of the other private facilities you worked at that really helped you in the college setting, like you still utilize today? Like what, what do you think college coaches could benefit from learning from private sector coaches? Uh, definitely getting better, like in a one-on-one -on -one setting, right? So I actually push, so like my mentor did for me, the interns we get at, at BC now, I actually tell them they have free time, go get an internship in the private setting, because I think they'll both help each other, right? Um, but probably the, the, the biggest thing would be in the collegiate setting, you're so used to putting on big fires, working with, I work with big rosters, so 38, 40, in for lift at one time. I don't get a lot of one-on-one -on -one time, so I'm not fine-tuning some smaller things. The private setting really exposes you to that. So if you're working small groups or even one-on-one -on -one or or one-on-two, -on whatever it may be, you actually have the ability to fine-tune everything, make everything perfect. In the collegiate setting, we don't have that luxury, depending on who you have for help and coaches helping you on the floor and interns. Um, you, you can do the best at ability that you, you can do. But at the end of the day, you can't make everything perfect like you can in the private setting. So I think the private setting and even, even the private setting, I work with some general pop clients, 100% made me a way better coach because I get to look at every single angle of every single movement and have an understanding of, have more conversations with how people are feeling based off exercises and volume. And that just prepares you for the collegiate setting when you now you have that times 38 or 40 that you have to worry about. So um, I, I'd say that's probably the biggest thing is just the ability to work in the one-on-one -on -one and fine tune everything. Right. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree too. And a lot of the gen pop, 
like when you're going in and you have a program, like you have to approach them a lot differently. And you also don't have to factor in so many things that you do with an athlete where you have factoring in practice games, like school and stuff like that. Yeah. Obviously like gen like general population has like life and work, but I, I tend to think a lot of people that are coming for specific like guidance from a coach in a private setting probably doesn't work a super labor intensive job. So they're probably working a desk job or like they're stay at home, like mom or something like that. So you don't have to really work with a lot of like physical, ex like extenuating circumstances. So you can just focus on the program and how they feel in that day versus have to like really deal with the chaos of practice, school, like meetings, film, all that sort of stuff. But, and you're right. Yeah. Like you can kind of get into the minutia of that one-on-one -on -one setting, which you, you deal with from time to time when you get to unique scenarios in college, but it, it's definitely does not happen. It's few and far between when you're te when dealing with teams. Yeah, absolutely. And, and then in the private setting too is in working with general pop is, you know, they're not elite athletes, so they can't just, you can't just show them a movement or tell them what to do. And then they just do it perfectly. It takes a lot of coaching and, and technique work um, to get them in the right positions. And um, usually these people are older too, if it's general pop and you can't afford to get them hurt because also the other thing in the private setting is it's all about the money, right? Uh, you got to keep your boss happy or whoever owns the gym, uh, make sure that the clients keep coming. So it's that fine line of, pushing them, but not pushing them too hard, making sure they feel good, but getting the adaptation you want. Um, where the collegiate setting, yeah, you got to keep coaches happy. Athletes need to buy into what you're doing. But at the end of the day, you know, they want to win championships. They want to get better. They're there for a reason, especially at the higher levels. M many are on scholarship, whatever. They're just willing to put in the work. Um, so those are kind of some of the bigger differences I see too. No, that's great. And I think that's, it's awesome that like, I'm assuming you're the internship coordinator, like on the Olympic side then? No, I'm actually not. I, I do okay. a lot of events with them, but I'm not, I don't recruit them or anything. That's somebody else. Gotcha. Well, I mean, it's cool that at least your message is, hey, go out and kind of see what the private sector is and gain some experience from it. Maybe you can bring it back to the college setting. But also at the same time, if you're still kind of in that point of your career where you're maybe still in school and you're looking for internship opportunities. Like if you're just dead set on one sector of it, of coaching, you might be missing out on another one that might be more well-suited for you. And, and even if you find your right Avenue, there's still, like you said, a lot of things that you can take away from the other profession, like professional sports or, or different divisions like in college, NIA, high school there, there's so many tactical like there's so many different things that you're able to pull away from those unique situations that might help you as a coach like with your programming with your communication skills whatever it is um when you find like the avenue that you want to stay in the sector you want to stay in yeah exactly I, I would push anybody any young coach listening any intern or any coach for that matter i, I would definitely push to go coach general pop clients or just be in the private setting and coach athletes there too, just because it's so different and it's going to make you a better coach. No, that's great. Hey, so I, I wanted to touch on this too. Obviously like BC women's across is a pretty well-renowned team and had a lot of success like before and like during your career now too. I know you guys have been, you won your first national championships for women's across in 2021, that COVID year. And like won the ACC championships last year. Like what was it like kind of from a strength coach perspective, like being part of a national championship, let alone it being BC's first for women's across? Yeah. So the, the national championship year in 2021 is, is something that's very special to me. And it's such a testament to all the athletes because what people don't understand is it was the COVID year, right? So there were so many restrictions and red tape to go through throughout that entire year. I mean, I could sit here and just rifle off things that we had to get through for an hour. And I'm no, like no different than everybody else. Everybody had to go through the COVID stuff. And being able to win that year, I think, is extra special because it's a testament to their resiliency, right? Their ability to 
you know, push through, you know, all these restrictions, like our whole fall when they came in, Boston college made a move that said no spring sports can train or have their non-traditional season. So for the, we only got to practice and lift and train for a month that fall. And that's after a whole summer and a whole season that was missed. So I didn't see some of these athletes for eight months. Right. And, and seeing them moving stuff like that, then they just get thrown onto us. And of course, of course the coaches want to practice, right. They haven't played their sport in almost a year. And so just working with athletic training and the coaching staff, you know, they're one of the best coaching staffs in the world. Um, they buy into what we do and they listen to everything. And, and obviously they're, they're so great with their sport. And um, we just developed a really good plan to kind of build them back up safely. Um, but also in a timely manner to get them ready for that season, because it wasn't a big window. And we had that four week block and then they went home for winter break too. And then they came back and it's three weeks, boom, into a season. So it was not a lot of time to get them ready. And, you know, from what I can remember is a few years now, it was just a lot of conversations about in, in at, at the time we didn't have the luxury of having any GPS metrics or anything like that too. So it was kind of a lot of guesswork. Um, but just a lot of conversations with athletic training and the coaches about what we do, like every single day was, was very strategized and um, you know, knock on wood, we had zero injuries that year. We had a full roster throughout the entire season. And I think that was a huge reason why we were able to be successful towards the end. Um, Going into the next few years, we're able to make the national championship. And unfortunately we've lost the last two years, but like you said, we were able to win the ACC championship last year, but it really has nothing to do with me. It's it's the culture from the coaches and they bring in the highest talent in the country and let iron sharpen iron. I mean, I'm just there to help, you know, help prepare them a little bit and, and and push them, especially in the off season and develop some adaptations. But at the end of the day, they're just great lacrosse players um, that you really don't need me at all. Yeah, I'm sure that was a pretty cool experience, it's especially in light of everything that was going on. I know, I know your program was probably vastly different than what you probably would have liked to do or preferred to do with the team not being under such tight restrictions like during COVID, especially for the fall. So the this question might not be great considering like those parameters, but like going into a season coming off a championship, like like what what ends up being the message like what parts of the program do you change? Because like a lot of people would probably say like, it's not broke. Don't fix it. Like I get, you have different parts. You don't get to control the outcome of the games, but you get to control the preparation. Like ultimately, is it a, is it a great program? What you had that year? Like why, why would you change much and just hope that it still gets them ready? Like what, what was your thought process going into the next year or message to the players when it came to, trying to kind of defend your title in a way. Yeah. So the biggest message was, you know, we don't talk about the championship season. So when they came in, there's not a word. We don't wear any of the gear that says championship, like nothing. Like we, we totally wiped that slate clean. It was a new team, new year. Um, and that wasn't me. That was from the head, down from the head coach. And I just supported that. Um, and then, you know, as far as like the program went, like you said, it didn't need to change much because knock on wood, we had no injuries that year. And, since then, we've obviously had some injuries and that year was maybe unique, whatever. But um, I just really felt like we got to run this program again. And, you know, if, it'll, if it worked that year, it'll definitely work this year. And I make minor tweaks and changes here and there. But uh, the big thing with that year was coming off the championship was we got a GPS system to kind of go off of now. So we had to accumulate some data that year. Um and what that allowed us to do is just tr plan out our weeks better, have our high days, our low days, our moderate days, um, just to preparing them for the for the games and, and those game weekends a little bit better. Um, but, you know, to answer your question, not a whole lot changed. Uh, and then when we lost the national championship last year, um, that's when – or two years ago, sorry, that's when things – I tried to change more in the program, met with the coaches, you know, what areas do, do you guys want to work on more? Um but yeah, I think, I think the mindset after winning or after success is you just got to, it, it's a new team. Like nobody cares what you did in the past. Um, they care about what, what can you offer? What can you do in the right now? What, what is this team going to be in the future? Um, and that was kind of the big message. Right. Yeah. It's, you kind of set the foundation again, but you have 
you have the framework of what was ultimately like a successful program before you just have different pieces to work with and you you still have to go through like we talked about like that the same process in the beginning because you're not playing with the same pieces but no, that that's great. Like, obviously, like a program should always change in some aspect and you're always going to put tweaks on it. And I'm sure GPS kind of helped reassure some of like your coaching thoughts that you already had and kind of fine tuned a few things. So like those small additions, once you have like the main piece like set in stone and you're working with like similar staff, like it, it's pretty much a recipe for success. And like it's kind of a testament like for you guys to be successful and be back at championship weekend consistently. And it's probably because everything else is pretty consistent and you do what you guys do and wipe the slate clean and start over. Yeah. And, and the GPS has helped us tremendously because we know, we know exactly what a championship game load looks like. We know what an in season, you know, a conference game looks like load wise, We know, our duration, our run volume, we know all that stuff. So um, uh, GPS has been a game changer for us just in keeping athletes healthy and, and making sure we don't peak early. So that's one of the big things I enforce and I kind of transmit to the coaches is that, yeah, we train hard all fall and they go home for winter break. I don't need them at their peak, you know, week one. We have so much trust in our ability to get better throughout the season. You know, we play for the last weekend of April and then into May for NCAA tournament. Like that's the standard, that's the expe expectation. So we really try to make gains all throughout the season. So with that being said is, you know, a lot of programs, they come in and they do like hard run tests right away and they want to be at their best for the first game of the year for us. And looking at our schedule, you know, we're, we're actually, we're known to lose one or two games earlier in the year and that we just get better from there. Um, so we're okay with that as long as we're getting better uh, throughout the season. Yeah. I think that, I think that's always the best approach. Like I've always, I've always said that like, and been super successful like duke men's across has always been like that like people talk about it and like i think it's social media and it ends up being like espn and like all those news radios it's it's something to talk about but they're like oh like someone like bc women's across duke men's across loses the first game of the season are they out of contention for next year like it's the first it's february like what are we doing but yeah it, the the most important thing is like you guys don't sweat it you just you make you make your adjustments and trust in the process and realize that like if you improve on those things and then you start making chipping away and having success ultimately you want to be playing on like close to memorial day weekend you want to be there so why not be our best when it actually matters like let's work through the kinks and see who we are as a team see what we need to do and make adjustments when the pressure is high and then improve, 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 rather than just try to sustain a high peak the whole way, which we all know is is not possible. Yeah, exactly. And I we have this conversation every single year, and our head coach does such a good job of you know having the team buy into this message. And and I you know say this all year, even in, even in September when they come in, is you know my goal is to get you ready for end of april may that like that's kind of our buzzword end of april may that's what we play for that's what we train for so we're all she the head coach is very competitive so she absolutely wants to win every single game she even though um you know off off air here we were talking a little about the non-traditional season and those play days um she wants to win all those too but those conversations about you know let's take away some of those play days because at the end of the day we're playing four or five play days in the fall we don't want to be our best till April. Those those play days really don't matter that much. And we're just putting a higher risk of injury and burning out sooner. So everything we do is just very progressive, building up to end of April into May. Yeah. It's bare, don't even keep score for those games. Just you use it, use it to like focus on yourself as, as a program. And like if you're a strength coach, like use it as kind of like a a mid-season barometer of hey where are we at what do we need to address like is the program so far doing well do i need to make adjustments like that's that's the best time to do it like really find out who you are don't try to match up with someone else because you're trying to you're trying to like you said be prepared for end of april may and if you're you can be competitive but if you're putting everything into those fall games and like non-traditional season 
like how much effort and intensity do you have left to put into the really important games at the end of the year that you want to win? Exactly. And like you said, and the last thing is you can't stay at that high level throughout the three month, three and a half month season. It's just not possible. And what GPS has helped create a formula where we have our high days, our lows, our, our peaks and our valleys so that we avoid the plateau, right? We train hard one day and then we, we go really easy the next day in terms of drills, in terms of run volume, in terms of everything that we do, um, just to make sure that we're constantly just improving and we never hit that plateau. Yeah, that's no, that's a great point. That's uh it's definitely something that adds into like it's another piece, another tool in the toolbox that you guys can utilize and actually fine tune everything you're doing. I, I want to kind of take you to this. I know you haven't had this happen with that team, too, but would it change your mindset at all if it was completely flipped on its head and like you were the last team in the nation. Like you had this program, like you put all this effort in, like the coaching staff, everything was working well in a way. And the training program you thought was great. Like what would you change about it if you weren't seeing success on the field? Or how do you like as a coach separate the difference between like performance and a like versus skill and ability? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a hard question too. Um, and something that could very easily happen. You, you never know what tomorrow's going to hold. So, you know, I think from a strength standpoint, what we do in the weight room, um, everything we do is measurable. So I'm able to see that it doesn't matter wins and losses. If we're able to get stronger and get faster, jump higher, do all those things. Um, you know, it doesn't matter wins or losses, you know, we're, we're kind of getting in the, in the right range there. It's a non-physical sport. Although the game is because for women's lacrosse, it's definitely getting more physical, but, um, you know, non-contact. I don't need to add a ton of muscle mass. I don't need to do all these things. I really need to get them strong to avoid some injuries, some resilience, and then really get them faster and more agile. And obviously conditioning is a huge portion of that. So in terms of the weight room stuff, I'd probably keep very similar. I'd look more out on the field, what I'm doing for speed. Can we get faster? Can we make room for gains there? Um, and obviously agility and then co conditioning capacity too. But you know, if that happened, it, it would be a lot of conversations with the coaching staff and what their goals are, because, you know, as it is right now, we're very confident in our ability. And, you know, we look at the schedule, we know who's going to be harder games, who's going to be easier games for us. And we can kind of plan our schedule like that and we can adjust every single week. But like you said, if it did get flipped on its head and we're the worst team in the nation, then maybe we're playing harder for some of those easier games and we want to put more eggs into those baskets. So that might change kind of our weekly undulation of high days, low days. It might change um, what they do out of practice those specific weeks. So I think more of the changes would be in there. Um, but in terms of what I do, I would definitely, I would obviously evaluate my program. Um, I'd make sure that I'm hitting everything that I need to, but you know, since it hasn't happened, I can only speculate. I, I would say that the strength stuff, what I do in the weight room would probably be very similar. Not much change there. More of my changes would be in the conditioning and getting them faster because it just resonates with the sport. And that's actually what they do, what they need to be good at. Gotcha. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's always an interesting concept. Cause like we talked about, like just the financial side of it too, like football, even some basketball strength coaches are getting paid some outrageous numbers to be tied to one team. So obviously like being tied to a coach, being tied to a staff that also gets tied into wins and losses. And it's, it's a hard like line to draw in the sand of where where does a strength coach's like responsibility fall? Like, does it is it in tune with wins and losses? Like, are we responsible for them? Because like I've I've had enough mentors say like if you're gonna take credit for all the wins, then you better also take full credit for all the losses too. It, it's a hard line to draw when people are getting cut for with large salaries because not having success, but also at the same time, like there are other people that aren't having much success at all, or they're having great success, but they're not tied in to what happens on the field. And they're just all about preparing. So, I mean, that it's a subject that we could probably go on forever. Um, and it's, it's a can of worms. We don't have to go down for sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, Personally, I, I don't evaluate myself off wins and losses. I just, 
I just don't think it's fair to do. We don't, I like to think lightly of myself and, you know, I think strength and conditioning definitely makes an impact, but at the end of the day, you know, let athletes be great. You know, they're going to be who they are. They're going to play their sport to their ability and coaches are going to coach their team how they want to coach. And um, we're support staff for a reason. That's how I look at it. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's, it's an interesting thing. I, I wonder how it's going to shape as like the things move forward. Cause I think, I think strength coaches are going to be potentially in for some changes when it comes to that. And if there's more separation between these conferences and stuff, I wouldn't be surprised if that like baseball is also like shifting to that more and having one strength coach. I wouldn't be surprised if they start doing it even more for more Olympic sports in the future at big schools. So, Hey, uh, I wanted to kind of shift topics over um, because even with all that stuff that you've got going on with your teams and like playing well into May and now basically dragging out your season through the summer um, so that you guys have a chance to compete again for the trophy. You worked on and you are about to release a new book. So like, can you give a brief overview of the book sweat more during peace, but bleed less during war? Um, because that's a whole process in itself. So why, why kind of write it? And like, who is the book really for? If you can kind of give us some stuff without giving too much away. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very excited to share this book with the world. Um, I've been working on it for a little bit over a year now, um, but it'll be officially published on January 30th. So we're approaching that date here um, as we record this anyway. And um, so the book is all about preparation, right? So during COVID, I kind of evaluated my role and what I do as a strength and conditioning coach. And at the end of the day, my job is to prepare them, prepare their bodies and their mental aspect to, to go out and play their sport. And I started to think about other realms of life, whether it's business and, you know, education and relationships and just day-to-day habits. And, you know, everything takes a degree of preparation. You know, some degrees way more than others, right? Going to the store that has a degree of preparation, it may not be that important, but you got to prepare um, your your wallet, make sure you have money in your wallet. You got to make sure you go to the store at the right time. So you get other things done in your day. You got to make sure you got the right food that you're getting so you can cook at home and everybody at your household likes the food that you're going to eat, whatever it may be. And then as strength coaches, we're preparing their bodies for resiliency, conditioning capacity, speed, all that stuff. So they can go and play their sport. Right. So preparation is just a big thing um, in my life. And I firmly believe that everything that I do, I've prepared for and um, I've kind of relied on that structure and that preparation process for reaching everything that I've done. Um, so I really want to make a book about it because it's very genuine to me. It's authentic to me and it's something I really believe in. So the quote, sweat more during peace, bleed less during war. Um, I actually stumbled upon it um, a couple years before the whole COVID year. So maybe 2018 when I was graduating from undergrad and um, it just really resonated with me. I like quotes. I think there's this deep meaning involved in such little words that you can pull from. And that quote just really hit home for me. I'm like, that's exactly what we do. And even though it's a military reference, you can kind of interchange some of the words. So, you know, sweat, what does that mean? That's, that's your preparation. That's your work. Um, you know, more during peace. So peace is that controlled environment. So you want to work harder during a controlled environment so that you bleed less during war. What does that mean? So bleed is the errors that you make or the failures that happen in the war. That's the competition, um, you know, when you're called upon. So, you know, it's just the essence of doing everything you can beforehand to make sure that when you're called upon, you're absolutely ready and you control what I call is the expected result. So that's the result of, of that you deserve, right? Based off what you put in beforehand, you deserve whatever comes to you based off the work that you put in before. Um, it's like that saying like, well, are you surprised that that happened? Like, you know, you didn't work hard all off season. Um, so yeah, your strength numbers went down. You decided not to run on the field during winter break. Um, so you came back out of shape. Are you surprised? No, you didn't prepare that. So that's kind of the essence of the book. Um, I'm very excited to share with the world. It's broken down into three different principles. And then within each principle are certain tactics that you can follow to improve that principle. And the goal for the book is to just, I don't think anything is going to be groundbreaking knowledge in there. I think there's going to be a lot of affirmation stuff in there. And I think it's going to resonate with people because I'm pretty vulnerable in some positions in the book and it's going to resonate with people because everybody goes through some of these topics that I discuss. And, um, you know, the, 
the main target for this book is first athletes and strength coaches, because strength coaches, that's our job. You know, we prepare our athletes to play and athletes just have to understand that preparation process. And, you know, as a coach, you know, my athletes know me as this quote, I have it written on my whiteboard in my office and all my winter training packets and all my summer training packets and their, their lift cards. It says it right on it. Um, this was way before the book too. So, um, it's just really something I believe in. And, and I think that a lot can, can be learned from it. No, that's awesome. I think that's great too. It's a, it's a testament to a lot of hard work and preparation. I'm sure that went into actually now about to have like the book hard copy, like in your hand. So that's, that's awesome. Like the congrats on that for sure. Um, but yeah, that's, that's cool too, that it's like who you're gearing it towards because that, that could be a great tool for coaches and athletes, but athletes specifically because coaches are always preaching this preparation and some athletes aren't really as bought into the weight room or maybe practice on some days, like to be able to have like that in their hands where they can kind of see like how important this is, how this actually gets them to their long-term goal. Like those daily things that they're doing to actually like chip away and stay on path. Like that that's a great tool for them rather than just kind of preach it, preach it and preach it. And like, say the same words, like it, it's the same as bringing in a guest speaker and they might say the exact same co thing a coach does, or like you're talking to uh, someone else's parents and you'll listen to them, but you won't listen to your own parents. Like the, the tone and the voice is a little bit different, even though you're preaching the same message. So uh, I I hope you guys have a lot. I'm, I'm excited to like when it launches to probably get my hands on it there and, and see what's going on with it. But um, I think it's going to be successful with a lot of athletes and coaches and definitely can resonate with them. Yeah. I, I think you'll like it. I think other strength coaches and, and sport coaches will like it, but it's also not only geared towards sports. I, I, I try to make other topics and other examples and other realms of life, whether it be business, you know, um, education, relationships, day-to-day -day habits. Um, I, I try to, I try to make a very authentic um, pitch to people so it resonates deeper because it's so easy to read superficial stuff that um, doesn't apply to you, right? I try to make it very applicable to what everybody endures on the day-to-day. -day. Um, I say athletes and coaches the most because that's where my experiences are. And like I said, it's very authentic. I'm not, I'm not making anything up in this book. And I've studied elite athletes. I've, I've interviewed coaches for this book. And um, you get a real kind of essence of what it takes to – um, ultimately reach success, whatever success is for you. Um, it's kind of a broad term, uh, but whatever success is for you, it's, it's cultivated by your ability to prepare. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Hey, can you touch on that a little bit more? You said you interviewed some like other coaches for the book as well. Like what was, what was like your process? Like, like actually writing the book, like how did you kind of approach it? Like in broad strokes to actually come to fruition, like go through the editing and actually get it published and get ready to release it? Yeah. So that's a great question. One that I get a lot, because to be honest with you, if you asked me two years ago, maybe even a year and a half ago before I started writing, I would have never told you I wanted to be an author or I was going to be an author. Or I was going to write anything. I haven't even written a blog before or nothing. Um, so it's very corny to say, but I felt like this book kind of flew right out of me. It was very easy for me to write because, like I said, it was very authentic. And um, I just had this idea one day. I don't even know what triggered it. I'd be lying to you if I did, if I told you anything. I just put pen to paper. I started writing down, you know, chapter titles, what I want to hit on. And, and I knew I knew if I was going to write a book, it was going to be something I believed in. And preparation is obviously what I believe in. Um and so I, I had a, a title for the book already. That That's a quote that I kind of live by. And from there, I just put pen to paper and I wrote down each chapter name, you know, certain areas that I want to discuss um, that supports the main goal of preparation. And then within that, I made specific tactics within each principle of, you know, um, examples that I can use and, and people that I can use for reference and, um, you know, just some evidence to back up my claims and then I just started typing away on the computer. And like I said, it kind of flew right out of me. But from there, once it took me about eight weeks to write, which isn't a long time. And don't get me wrong, it's not a long book. It's about 160 pages. Um, so it's whatever moderate style book for, for nonfiction. And um, 
the first thing is once it was all done, I was like, all right, well, is this worth anything? Should I pursue this? Like, like what next? I don't know any author. Like, where do I go from here? I got a computer. Um, I got my hard drive in there saving it just in case it gets wiped away. I'm not going to let that happen. You know, 58,000 words. I'm not letting go to waste. So, um, you know, I had my fiance at the time, my wife now, you know, look at it and, and she supported me hundred percent. She's like, this is actually pretty good. I think this could sell. Um, and that's just her, her honest opinion. And, and she probably would lie to me anyway. But, uh, so then I had a few other close friends and, and people look at it and just say, be honest with me. Like, would you read this? Do you like the title of the book? Should I pursue this? And the feedback was great. And, um, from there I kind of had to hit Google and say, all right, what's next? What do I do next? So um, I had to look for, you know, literary agents to represent the work. I had to look for publishing houses. Um, and then from there, um, I was very fortunate. I was able to get multiple offers on it. So from there, I, I had to go through all the offers and make sure that um, it was going to be my work that's represented and someone's not going to come in and change everything. Cause that was very important to me um, that it was my work. And um so, I mean, that that alone takes about a month just to go through all these contracts because I'm not a lawyer and I wasn't about to hire a lawyer. So I want to make sure that I was covered. And, um, you know, once I signed the contract with the publishing house, it was just kind of handed over to them, you know, you know, meetings weekly about, you know, the process of the editing. And you got to go through editing, which is a, a back and forth process that takes months, you know, almost five months of editing back and forth. Um, and then from there, it's, you know, internal design, external design of the book. So the cover, the wrap, all that stuff. And then you get into kind of the marketing and the endorsements. That's when I'm, you know, reaching out to, you know, um, coaches and, and famous figures to help me market this book and push this book, see if they'd like it. Um, and then I'll kind of back up. I kind of missed your question there. Yeah. While I was writing the book, um, I did reach out to some coaches and, and I did some research just online and read some other books too any knowledge I could get to kind of add to the book to just support some evidence um, was kind of the process. But what I learned is that people are willing to help. People are willing to offer um, advice about anything. And uh, you just can't be afraid to reach out. You know, I think early in my life, even getting into the strength field, you hesitate a little bit to reach out to some of these big name coaches and, you know, these big schools that maybe you don't think you're able to get in with and whatever it may be. And through this process, I just learned that, you all got to be willing to put yourself out there. You know, I'm, I'm not an author. I never claimed to be an author, but apparently I am now. And that started from, you know, just an idea and then being vulnerable and then putting myself out there and not being afraid to fail. Right. This book could be very unsuccessful. Who knows? We'll find out and we'll find out on the release date. But, um, you know, it was just a really good process that I kind of learned a lot about myself and just learned about the writing process as a whole. That's awesome. No, it's, it sounds like a very long kind of tedious process. It, it sounds like from what you did to maybe the easiest part was just putting pen to paper. Everything else after that was absolutely was, was where the hard pieces come in because it's pretty uncharted territory for yourself. Like I'm, I'm sure a lot of coaches feel the same way. I, I hate writing. I'm terrible at it. And I write, I write short, like blogs, like very sparingly and they take way too long. They take way too long. And I, I'm illiterate basically when it comes to it. So I I can imagine like how hard it was and like how much that kind of gets added to your plate, but it's cool to kind of see the fruits of your labor and all that work and preparation that went into it to see like a final result. It's got to feel the same way, like a championship does when you realize like, Hey, everything that I was doing, like all the hard work, like all the sacrifice I put towards, like it's now I get to kind of see the success and take a look back from like the mountaintop and realize like I did this to get here. I did all these things to get to this point. And this is pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'll find out the success of this book within the next few months, but, you know, I promised myself that yeah, I don't care where this goes. I don't, it's not going to be a bestseller, whatever the case may be. Maybe it will be, who knows, but um, it's just something I can be proud of and something I can always remember. And, you know, maybe there'll be another book soon. You know, you never know. I, I, I did find that I do enjoy writing. If it's some, it's just like reading. I like reading. If I like the topic, if I don't like the topic, I will, you will lose me in a second. Same thing with writing. I didn't struggle writing this book at all. Um, like I said, it took eight weeks. It like flew right out of me. And 
if I was writing about a topic that I didn't believe in or wasn't authentic or um, wasn't passionate about, it probably would have taken me years to write because I, I wouldn't be that invested in it. Um, but yeah, just the whole process of it was, was really enjoyable. And, you know, it really hit home is when I got these advanced copies sent to me from the publisher that I kind of use for marketing. Um, and to just see my name on the book with my cover and then you open it up and it's like, I wrote that. It's a pretty cool feeling. Yeah, no, I I still buy like hard copy books too because I like I like how it is. But uh, being the author of a book too has got to be pretty special to have it like in your hands, like and feel it. So and have your name on the front cover. So that's pretty cool. Hey, with with all that going on, like everything that you've got, like family life, coaching, writing this over the last year and getting it ready to publish and um, release. Like, how do you still find ways to kind of stay active and train? Like, what does it look like since your football days? Like, what are you kind of currently doing now? Yeah, so I, I just love to challenge myself and I love to train. It's my passion. So I, I never, I always prioritize that. So whether I'm writing a book or coaching, whatever, I always find time. Even if it's at a, a crazy hour, I always get it in. So my kind of cycle works like this. It's a little bit weird because I enjoy a lot of things. I usually spend the entire first part of the part of the semester or the fall semester, just doing a lacrosse program or doing a, doing a team's program just to stay athletic. So I'll do all their runs. I'll do all their weight room stuff. And that's usually when I feel the best. Then when the semester ends, I usually get into like a meathead phase, like where I am right now. I'm just like crushing my body, doing a bunch of strength work, um, Olympic lifting, stuff like that, high volume. And um, this is typically when I feel the worst because I'm just crushing myself. I usually put on my muscle mass, in, in this period now leading up to the summer. And then when the summer hits, I do a ton of cycling and I, I do some races too. And so I cycle all summer and I pretty much lose everything that I gained throughout the year. So all the muscle mass I have, all the weight, I'll drop 15, 20 pounds in the summer. It's ridiculous. Um, and then the summer will come to an end and then I just go through the sequence again. I'll hop on an athlete's program and do that again. So I've been doing this probably the last three years, three years and I like it. It's just, I always hate when I lose muscle mass and all that stuff, but I love cycling and I love getting outside in the summer. So um, I really do like to get that in. And then I've also been doing a ton of sauna and cold plunge recently uh, just to switch it up and just do a new challenge. But um, at heart, I really do love conditioning, which is why I do some cycling. And then um, I always try to coordinate some staff conditioning that we can do um, at BC, which is just all our interns, all our staff get together one morning. And it's just the time we can get away from everything else and just focus on ourselves and compete a little bit and push each other. So that's usually pretty fun. That's cool. I've I've started to hear that more and more with uh, college strength coaches too. I don't know if it's a, I don't know if it's a trend or if it's it's just really conducive to what the schedule is. Like where it's almost like seasonal training. It's like, hey, this is kind of like my main teams. Like I'm a spring heavy laden kind of coach. Like that's what my sports are. I'm going to do the majority of my like, like athletic training, like in that fall period and just like do what they're doing and the winter, like, all right, it's a little down period, like holidays are around, like it's easy if I'm on the road to hit a hotel lift or like go, if I'm at, like you're at your parents' house and all they have is like, whatever's in the garage, just hit some bodybuilding stuff and like arm farm. And then you get back to season, you're traveling and then summer like you can actually get outside a little bit too so it's cool to kind of dabble in a little bit of everything and it it makes you i think it it probably makes you appreciate like what athletes go through and it's it's something that i tie into my athletes like off-season programs when they're away from campus is like hey go do something that's not related to your sport like don't get burnt out from it and anything are there any other like lessons that or like maybe takeaways from your own training and like how you kind of approach it that maybe help a little bit with what you do um, with your athletes now too, or maybe how you program in a way? Yeah. So I like to know how the athletes are going to feel. And I learned this from some mentors and early on in my career that everything I prescribe, I just run on myself first, just so I know how they feel. I know how to coach it. Um, and then, uh, so that's kind of why I do their programs with them. But um, I, I would say that, that that's really it. I, I, you know, I'm not going to go prescribe a bunch of cycling or anything like that. It, I'm kind of the same way, especially for lacrosse. Once they finish up their season, I do not demand a lot of them in the summer. Like, like do minimal work. Um, like you said, get out, do something that you don't typically do. 
and then we'll build once you get back in the semester. But um, I think the big thing with training for coaches is just, you know, get out of your comfort zone a little bit. You got to get out of your comfort zone as a coach. You got to be vulnerable in positions and um, work on things that you're not good at so you can teach it better. Um, you know, I remember when I was a grad assistant, my clean technique was terrible. So I took a whole year dedicated to the clean. I hit a good clean goal actually for weight, but I became such a better coach at coaching the clean because I was so technically sound at, you know, working on the fine things on myself that when I saw other people do it, it was just second nature for me to coach it up. No, I like that. That's, that's great. I think a lot of coaches lose sight of that, like vulnerability and like being willing to try something new, like long, the longer you get into your career, and then, I don't know, life happens or you have more responsibilities or you're kind of setting your ways about this is like how I like to train. I don't feel like you can do more, but I've always liked to kind of challenge myself. Like I there's things I still hate and I'll still try to do like I still I'm forced to run. So I'll do that. Like it's, I just I get in my own head. I, it doesn't help me very much. I like to lift certain ways and like I've dabbled in different sports, too, but it's fun. It may, it makes, it definitely makes training interesting. And I I've dealt with it before in the past, like being in the weight room all the time, coaching all the time, like trying to coach or trying to lift in your like college weight room or trying to in your garage or, or wherever you go to train. Like it's a lot of time around the same stuff. It's hard to have a hobby that's so related to what you do in work, even though it's a really beneficial hobby or skill or whatever you want to call it um so kind of mixing it up or like having seasonal training and stuff like that i think that's a that's a great idea for anybody that feels like overwhelmed with like i i don't want to lift because i'm at that's basically my office like yeah i, I don't want to go back to work yeah that's such a good point that, that's why i do a lot of cycling in the summer and that's why i tell the staff we do staff conditioning right it'd be so easy for us to just come in and do a staff lift that's what a lot of staffs do but my philosophy is that we live in the weight room, all our sets and like we're on the floor all day coaching sets and reps and all that stuff. Let's go do something that we don't typically do. Let's get out of our comfort zone a little bit. And just to piggyback on what I said a little bit earlier is I think there's a lot of buy-in with the athletes too, when they see that you're doing what they're doing. I don't believe that you have to be in the best shape or train as hard as possible to be a good coach. I think you'd be a coach and not train at all. I don't think that matters. But I do think you get some credibility when you are putting in the work that they are. And so like my athletes will know that um, in the fall when I'm running their program that they're doing, I'll do it in the morning and then I'll coach them up at nine o'clock when they come in. Especially on the run days, they'll come in and be like, all right, what were your uh, 150 times today? Or, you know, what was your time on that run? And they'll try to compete with me a little bit. So it's just extra buy-in, extra credibility. And I think the athletes like to see that. Yeah, no, that's that's a great way to do it too. And it, it's fun to have a little bit of banter back and forth with your athletes. I remember doing that a bunch with them. Like I'm not, I, I can't throw a baseball. Those guys know the last time I did, my arm was numb for the first two innings of a Padre game. It wasn't, it was not a good idea. And <laughs> the same, the same time, like I had, I had lacrosse guys that would always come up and try to wrestle me. And uh, like one guy would like tackled me like at the end during stretch circle. And he doesn't want that smoke. And I buried him. So <laughs> it's a, uh, it's, it's fun to kind of go back and forth with them and them to know that you're, you're invested in training. You might not be the same skill level. You not might, you might not be doing the same exact things at them, but like you, you build a sort of camaraderie because you're not like preaching from a soapbox. You're, 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 you're speaking from experience and it's still like relevant experience in a way um, you're not just like saying like the heydays of when I played. It's like, hey, I did this. I did this last night. I did this yesterday. Might not be the same. They might not respect it the same way. But like, I think at the end of the day, they realize like you're still working on yourself. And that's what that's what that is. Yeah. They, and like with a conditioning sport, too, when you're conditioning them hard in the off season, like that, that works not fun. But it's they understand it's part of the preparation process. And when they see that you're willing to do that, too, and you're not even training for a sport, you're just doing it. Um, I think that hits with them a little bit deeper. They're like, all right, well, I got to get ready for a sport, so I should be doing this. Yeah, that's a really good point, too, because speed and agility, like lifting, um, all that stuff, like you're coaching mechanics and stuff. Unless you're like cross country, like track, and you're like doing slightly longer distant runs, if it's conditioning for a field-based sport, 
you might be encouraging or you might be like yelling times, but you're really just kind of, you're kind of the guy blowing the whistle and telling them they did it right. They did it wrong or they didn't make it. They have to do it again. Like it's not a fun feeling. So yeah, you're, you're completely right. If, if they see you kind of go through it or they know that you're doing probably the harder part of anything, because most people would rather lift than condition. Um, that's definitely even that's, that's more like brownie points probably for from them to you. Yeah, absolutely. That's such a good point. You're right. During conditioning, the conditioning portion of our runs, I'm really just there with a stopwatch saying go and when to stop. And, <laughs> and uh, that's a really good point because no one wants to just be yelled at and just say, you know, do this, do that. When they see somebody actually putting the work to um, it's more respectable for sure. Definitely. Hey, so uh, Nick, like any good training session, uh, we end the show with the finisher, which is perfect for this. So I got four quarters, four questions, and uh, a little bit of conditioning overtime at the end, but you can go rapid fire with them. You can take your time and you can expand on any, uh, but you ready? Yeah. All right. First one I got for you, biggest influence in strength and conditioning and favorite athlete growing up. Uh, biggest influence in strength and conditioning would just be my mentor because I would not be in this position without him pushing me to the collegiate setting that I absolutely love. So biggest influence would be Mike Poitomani. Um, and then favorite athlete growing up, it's got to be Tom Brady. Uh, I'm from Boston, New England area. So, and I played quarterback, so I always looked up to him. All right. Hey, so well, I know you had a lot going on in your plate with the, uh, with the book and you already talked about your cycling and everything too, but when you're not doing anything athletic, you're not coaching, what are some of your hobbies that aren't strength conditioning related? Uh, so I like to go hiking. So I'll go up in New Hampshire. We'll do a lot of hiking up there in the winter. I do a lot of skiing. So I just, I just like being outside usually. Um, and then um, I like to write. So that's become my new hobby now. Nice. Hey, so if you weren't in like coaching right now and strength conditioning, what do you think you would be doing as a profession and I might have to take away I don't know if you can say author because you said it too many times but if it's author that's fine um well would be a would a sport coach or no no coach at all no yeah that's fine yeah I would be a sport coach uh, football probably even basketball I just I love being around athletics so it would definitely be somewhere in there I I really wouldn't fit in any other realm of life that's a promise <laughs> All right. Well, I know it changes with the seasons a little bit, but with your own training, if you were setting up like your perfect ideal training session, what music is playing in the speakers and what are you going to do to eat right after that? Yeah. So my colleagues think I'm a weirdo for this and my athletes think I'm weird for this too, but I don't listen to music when I work out conditioning or in the weight room at all. Um, I use that time to just like do some deep thinking and just focus on it's usually early in the morning. So I don't want to listen to music anyway. Um, and sorry, what was the second question? What would I eat after? Yeah. What's uh, the best post-training meal? Uh, it's not that good for you, but I go straight to five guys and get a nice big burger. It's hard to do that. at 6 a.m. though. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> you said ideal though. You said, ideal. oh yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, <laughs> of course. Hey, so last one I got for you for overtime. Um, what what is your favorite way like to continue to sharpen the sword? Like, where do you go for your resources and like, what, what do you kind of do to recharge the most and get back the fullest for your yourself and for your coaching ability? Um, so from like a, like a learning standpoint, I, I, I use my network to just learn new things and, you know, reach out to people like you and, and just try to learn some stuff to really sharpen the sword from a coaching standpoint. Um, but then just to recharge and just to relax and get away from it a little bit. Um, that's why I do like the hiking and, and skiing and cycling and just, just long duration stuff where I'm just me with my thoughts. That's why I do a lot of sauna work, cold plunge work. Um, just because there's nothing else involved. It's just you versus whatever the obstacle is. And you can just do, you learn a lot about yourself in those situations. Yeah, definitely. You, you seem like you kind of simplify it too. Like you can't really escape from something when it's longer duration or like if you go hiking and you're halfway up, um, you got to come back down at some point too. So 
you're kind of stuck in that situation. And if you're not, if you're kind of disconnected from the world, it's, it's definitely different and it, it's definitely introspective and it gets you thinking. So that's, that's pretty cool to be able to recharge and also kind of use it as a way to sharpen the sword as well. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Hey, well, Nick, for anybody that's got any questions for you, um, obviously like plug the book, um, the release date, you said January 30th, right? Yep. Yeah. So where can they purchase the book, pre-order it, um, get their hands on it, and where can they follow you in, in BC this year? Yeah. So sweat more during peace, bleed less during war. My book will be officially released on January 30th um, and it's available everywhere. So it'll be, um, you know, audio, digital, uh, paperback, hardback through Amazon, Barnes and Noble, IndieBound, 30,000 other retailers. You can get it anywhere. Amazon is probably your best bet. Um, I have a website, nicksedato.com. I post a lot of information about the book, so you can find links there for that. You can learn more about the book, why I wrote it, um, who's involved, who endorsed it, and things like that. Uh, and then I do most of my content sharing, strength and conditioning related, um, and all my networking on my Instagram, and that's just at Nick Sedato. Awesome. Hey, well, congrats again on the book and um, looking forward to seeing what you guys put forward on the field and all that preparation kind of gets to come to fruition now going into the spring. So I appreciate you coming on today, man, and and sharing. It's uh, It was good to chop it up with you today. So thanks. Yeah, this was a blast. Thanks for having me on. Of course, man. That's it for this episode of The Strength Game. Thank you again to this week's guest and to our sponsors. Be sure to connect and keep up with our guests at the links in the description below. Remember to subscribe to us on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast provider to stay up to date on all future episodes. Also, check us out on YouTube and CoachO'Brien.com, where you can find all the video versions of these episodes, as well as show notes, episode schedule, and much more. Comments, ratings, and reviews are always welcome and appreciated. Thanks again for tuning in, and be sure to join us next week for another great episode of The Strength Game.